unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Praise God. 2008, November, I'm given a job to work as a banker. And um, I banked for five, I think, to six years of banking. But I was given one of the most beautiful opportunities. And that was, I joined a bank which was just beginning. Praise God. Now joining a bank which is just beginning from scratch is different from finding an existing entity where you find systems and everything going on. And not only did I begin with a bank that had begun just one year before, I began with a branch that was just beginning from scratch. I didn't find an already existing and functioning branch. And uh, we went through the usual orientations and many things fell where they had, long and short, one year, as I had a supervisor, two, three years down the road, branch manager into DTB, then I quit into preaching the gospel. But I had a great opportunity during that time. Um, we had a very, very wonderful fellow. Um, in the leadership. He introduced us to a very simple mind on what it means to brand, what a brand was. Spoke very simple words. His presentation was about 10 slides. But that which seemed a very simple thing, for me it caught my heart so big to the intent that I went back and studied more. It became a passion for me. And at one point, even on the branch, I became a warrior and many things like that. And I had an opportunity to attend many meetings regarding the brand, how are we to keep the brand, how are we to build the brand, how are we to maintain the brand. Indeed, the bank I worked with was among the first banks to break even. In the time frame, many of the banks started. But I have never seen a business or a bank that was strong on brand. I never, because I mean, yeah, I knew friends who worked in different banks. I went to bank in different banks. I saw it all. And this was the strength of this business in the whole region. So for me, I took time to study through, study through, and I went a bit so deep in understanding what branding was. For me, it opened up a spiritual cornucopia of revelations that came flooding my soul and spirit concerning something that seemed worldly but was very deeply spiritual. And it has helped me greatly in building Fanero. Greatly. Greatly. Praise God. So I asked the ultimate question, what is branding? I asked that question because in the society we're living in it has been grossly misrepresented and vaguely defined. Some people think branding is logos. If you have a logo, wow, he has branded. Some people think branding is having colors everywhere. And those are some of the minutest details and elements of a brand. They're some of the smallest. Are you following what I'm saying? There's a deep understanding of what it means to be a brand and what a brand is. So then I'll ask you, what is a brand? I have read many definitions of branding. Brand, and many people have defined brand. But for me, the most definitive mind on brand is from a fellow they call Alina Wheeler. And Alina Wheeler says, a brand is a promise. An idea, the expectations that reside in the head or inside each, if it's a business, customer, right? 
it's from you as an individual but it's all about them if i'm a pastor what is the promise that the church member has right about me what do i promise them what is the idea that i give them are you following what i'm saying what is the expectation that they have of me as a pastor for example but in your business side you understand what is the mind they have about your product what is the mind they have about your service what is the mind they have about your business what is the mind they have people have about your company we live in a dispensation of the i don't people who have an i don't care attitude of me i don't care what people think as long as i'm doing listen that's foolish it's not even biblical when a man is not cognizant of what people think of him in the right sense that man does not have a value that man does not have value proverbs 27 verses 21 in the nkjv proverbs 27 21 it says the refining of a, the refining of a pot is for silver and the furnace for gold and the man is valued by what others say of him when men see and say you start to get value whatever men see and say about you defines your value there may be many people who offer the same product you give the same services you give the same everything you give but what do they see and say about you? Are you following what I'm saying? What is the idea people have about you? What is the perception people have about you? If you're a business person, if you're a company person, if you're a career person, you're working somewhere, you know, you're building applications, what is this thing that people know about you or the business? What What is the their opinion their attitude their perception of you what is the idea when they mention coca-cola what comes to your head you understand there are many things they have done to become coca-cola when they talk about coca-cola you think of christmas do you understand what i'm saying when they talk of coca-cola you think of food this has been deliberate has been put in our subliminal part of the brain because all the advertisements have taken us that way are you hearing me but it's more than just christmas it's more than just the day it's the festive season it's what it means to the young child it's what it means to the person who has been working all year round and they're going to get their holidays in december they're going to go back and visit their families they're going to sit back you know if you live in cold areas they're going to sit next to fireplaces and then exchange stories and pleasantries and then you know eat meat and talk you understand and then you know santa claus you get my point when you think of certain brands like when they say if i say for example mercedes what comes to your head just mention what quality when we say mercedes what comes to your head expensive uh-huh class excellence you understand what i'm saying they have built that brand it is a perceived idea it's not necessarily it ought not to, in fact if, if you go deeper you'll be so shocked that many of these things that are built they don't necessarily come so much in the words that we speak but what has been drawn on our souls our minds and imprinted in us to be perceived as you look at any mercedes advert and look at the class of the man sitting in it that's why you're saying class i've seen many of them a guy, guy walking coming with a suit he opens there's a difference there's a reason why they don't show a guy from school advertising an email you understand no but it's a targeted market there's a reason there's an intention there's a purpose to why these things are human perception is a very powerful entity to tap into when a man needs transaction 
anybody who needs to transact begins by attracting perception. If you don't learn how to attract the perception of men, you will never transact effectively. That's the beginning of human transaction, perception. How do they see you? You get my point? Back in the day in high school, we used to have issues of why some funny boys used to take beautiful girls. You see, for us, they were funny. Do you understand? Eh? But to the girls, they were lining. Eh? Who is understanding what I'm saying? Perception. Are you following what I'm saying? I'm going to begin from the bigger thing and then start zeroing down. So somebody will ask, what is brand? Defined for you, I mean, Alina Wheeler, but I've also defined for you biblically that even in the Bible, it's there. The value of a man is in what people say about him. You are still of a cheaper value because people have not said. You see, words are power. If somebody says that woman is rich, they are planting a seed. Spiritually, they're saying something that is evoking a very deep dimension in your spirit to effect that. It's like parents when you're raising up your children and tell them, you stupid child, you foolish child. You know, the things you continue to say in this child, they start to sink. And that's why now we're dealing with a very huge line of very mm, disconnected minds in our generation. Why? Because of the words that were spoken. The praises of a man. How is a man spoken of? He says it's like the refining of a pot for silver and the furnace for gold. You see how furnace works with gold? What does furnace do to gold? See, right? And the pure are the value. Are you following what I'm saying? But the value is in what men see and say. The value is in what men perceive and say. Why do three people come in able to do the same work and person A does it better than B and C, but person C takes it. Sometimes person A might have all the ability, but B of a wrong or an indifferent perception to the person giving the contract. Are you following what I'm saying? And surely Christians who are also in the business world, the world that is seen, you must know how or whichever way to win. You must know how to add value on yourself. Because value defines your price. You understand what I'm saying? If they say Mercedes is this much, you don't say, ah, that is no way. They tell no, go for Corolla. <laughs> go for Corolla. Because they define themselves and position themselves as a car making company that makes for lower income. That was their perception. And that's how. But now over the years, they're also now changing. They're advancing now to the other market too, right? Some of you, you of course know what they call segmentation. Who is in my segment? Who do I really want? You understand? Eh? Because some people don't even have definitions when they are going out to work. No, who is my target? You understand? Eh? Why is it that it's very hard to find a city bank person coming on your door to sell an account? But if equity bank boys are moving, all of them are sales representatives, equity, you understand, sales representatives, because their segmentation is different. It's part of that. But to the mind and idea, what is the history of branding? Branding is thousands of years old, by the way. It's hundreds of years old. But what we have and what they'll give you is definitions that begin from where the idea begins from you understand what i'm saying now the word brand comes from a very old news germanic language i think from where many scandinavian language come from it was brander like b-r-u-n-d-r is where the brand it means getting a hot iron before the idea brand when you say brand it was simply getting a hot iron eh? And back in the day, they used to identify their things eh, to protect their properties, like animals, cattle. Eh? They get a hot iron and put it on their cattle. Right? You want to keep your cattle, you fold an iron and put E, burn it. Right? Then when you put that iron and then burn it on a cattle, E, Emma. So everyone who walks around says that is Emma's cow. 
at first it wasn't a value idea. At first it was simply a protection of property. Do you understand? A protection of property. So that people don't steal their cows, people don't mix other people's cows, because people were smart back in the day. Guy can give you a sick cow and take a healthy one. That was ideally the idea. But it evolved. You know, you should watch the things that evolve on themselves as society evolves. Right? There are some things that evolve and there are some things that don't. The things that don't die, right? And when they die, they're not even beneficial to be taught or to learn about. But there are things that evolve with time. Hmm? You see how technology has been. Our history of banking. I can speak as a banker because I knew those days. Hmm? Banking as we know it versus what it was. Back in the day, there was no money. People used to transact goods. Yeah? Goods for goods. Again, the brand would help somewhere. First, if you leave your cow in the market, you can find it. You see what I'm saying? And it's not switched for, I know this was the one, how do you know? Is there any proof? But even yours was brown. You understand? But it went deep into, now people saying, ah, but some goods are heavy. Can we get an idea, right? And give something value for the exchange. It began with things like gold, then transitioned, gold became heavier. Then it started to become the whole idea of money. People don't know that money is an idea. That idea has too much value. People even guard it. You understand it? People work for it. People die for it. People kill for it. It's just an idea. Money became too much, right? First they were like coins. Coins also become heavy, right? Now we need somewhere to keep them. This is how the idea of banking comes. We keep your stuff, you come for it and then transact. But then we also have challenges that sometimes we move further places transacting. Oh, so multiple branches, right? Transitions into now how technology comes through in the reconciliation of the accounts and then later internet brings the miracle, you know, transactions go online, robust real-time sy systems evolve and then you can transact yeah, to and fro. Yeah. Before that, there were electronic fund transfers. Yeah. Processes going to now we are at a place where we in visa. Yeah. It's my debit cards. Recently, we saw some of you saw a video where now guys are putting chips here. And, you just, <laughs> and then he pays in a restaurant. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. But you see where we came from. Hmm? Then the science of markets has also changed. Amazon has taken over, Alibaba. Think of all these guys, Airbnb. All those guys, they don't have physical assets, but the brain is working. Eh? Science is doing its math. Eh? Uh, Uber, there are people working for them. You see, eh? me, I'm curious, where next? <laughs> Sometimes I think about it, like, but the people of 1700s, when they look at us, eh? no, when we look at them, they look so stupid. Like, what were you thinking? It's like that I thing when I said, if you look at how operations are going in, in medicine, eh? the guys of long ago, I think, eh? when they come back to us, they think, that, but what, why couldn't we see this? How couldn't we even have this mind? What, what were we thinking? You, you understand what I'm saying? Eh? You can't believe that at one particular point, it was impossible for somebody to transact without a good current. You get it? But now it's a small little card. Money is sent in hours, seconds, mobile money. It has reflected. Oh, that way is the money. We don't know. You get it? But that's, that's where we're going. Now, don't think that branding stays. It also evolves. And I'm going to come to that. But the basic history was from there. And then through there also, People started making expensive pieces of art, uh, pottery. And then they started putting identity, a mark on them to say this was mine, this is mine, because they used to sell them, right? They used to exhibit them. And sometimes, because of basic competition, some things used to look similar. And so to protect somebody's thing, to say, ah, mine has a bigger base on that, it's more than that. Put a mark on it. So the branding in the Chinese cultures is old. Very, very, very old. And then somehow in the 1800s, early 1800s, 
that's when the whole idea of branding starts to come up into the minds of men to think how far can it go it started to evolve in all other products that you know that you needed to give a name to your thing that you needed to give an identity to your thing you needed to define something that is yours that someone can define with you understand during that same time also men marked territories through branding eh? kingdoms earlier also had things like crests eh? family crests kingdom crests all of these things were there now they went from simply protecting property to territory anything that was owned needed an identity but what they did not know that everything they owned that needed an identity later was going to define their value are you following what i'm saying you see gold is free in the ground but when it leaves the ground it gets funny but in the form of the ground it's free you, you understand what i'm saying there are many things that might not or are not even of price but with the right mind with the right person with the right spirit they can get value and sell expensively you understand small little things and ideas then in the early 1900s 1920 something it starts to evolve into now bigger people starting to get the ideas of building businesses into the 1950s where we have the dawn of mass media television that's when now the whole issue of branding takes shape and gets identity and people now say this is because mass media right media brings too much on the table on this thing called branding because again it's perceived right when you run a commercial it's perceived do you know that to run a 30 seconds commercial 30 seconds commercial in america on a super bowl game to just say we will be back and you run 30 seconds commercial you pay five million dollars five million dollars now brands are managed because the time it was simply identifying putting names to your things no now we manage the perceived idea the perception of men concerning our goods our services and products that's why now the biggest businesses from the time of the procter and gambles and the whole group they started inventing ideas of how do we now manage brands deliberately because they shifted from being little small trademarks of let me put a trademark on my business to protect competitors from taking my name and what and they became bigger and bigger the brands grew the identities their ingredients improved before we know that they are corporate businesses they are global are you following what i'm saying how do we manage what is perceived because one perception can change everything some of you have been to the united states has anybody uh, been to a restaurant they used to call chipotle they convinced us that everything in Chipotle was organic. I remember the first time I went to America, I made the line to eat Chipotle. Chipotle uh, told everyone that you know what? It's organic. That statement alone, in a poor economy, you know, because I mean, even organic food is expensive, isn't it? Now to tell an American that you can just stand on the streets and buy a burrito, eh? Chipotle, my goodness, it was a miracle. We entered, we made line. Now, the Ugandan, I know what organic avocado takes like. Somebody shout hallelujah. If you have understood it, say amen. Yes. We ate. Then one chap took these things under a laboratory and proved that Chipotle was not organic. Next time I flew in America, I ran to Chipotle, I did see the line. I said, what a guy. What's going on? People are not entered. Chipotle is empty. You understand what I'm saying? Up to today, Chipotle was never the same again. Because one guy did his research. Some of you remember years ago, when Raibena was the thing for all sick children. Now, some college teacher gets kids and puts them under a laboratory and they say oh vitamin c they're trying to test foods with vitamins no, they, lo and behold some kids say, oh, they give ideas of what should we test bullion kids say right they put ribena under what and the thing didn't have vitamin 
they sued Ribena very expensively in the hundreds of millions of dollars. From then on, Ribena has never been the same again. It has never been the same again. Are you following? Why? Because they killed our perception of vitamin C. No. For us who were raised in our culture, Banangi, Ribena was blood. It was reddish. You understand what I'm saying? Eh? For us it was blood. But then when they tell us at least there is vitamin C, you're like, ah, can you have? Now it doesn't even have vitamin C. You mean I'm drinking a grape without vitamin, a fruit without vitamin? Later on when they changed, now they put with vitamin C. They write with vitamin C. You get my point, eh? But one thing like this that changes the perception of a thing can kill everything. Some businesses have died because the perception has been changed. Our coffee story in Uganda. Coffee as a commodity in this nation brings in about $400 million. Right? A year. About that, isn't it? But if you look at our yield, if we did transaction right, you understand? And stopped selling coffee as a product and commodity and looked at it on a deeper angle of a program. Gave it a brand and an identity. Every person who has done coffee for a long time tells you, consultants tell you, that it could go from 400 million to 4 billion. Are you hearing me? That's almost 100 times more. And you're going to try to build a story. And someone came into that story and gave a wrong impression of our coffee. And the leading exporters were thwarted. We don't know why the person did it. But for what could bring us $4 billion, it's bringing us $400 million. Because somebody gave a wrong perception on the same commodity. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. So it's powerful that this thing can build you or break you. This thing can make you or not because it gives you value. It sets your price in the innate things. Even when people don't see, it defines who you are. It defines who you are. And we spiritual people must know how to do this spiritually. Because, you know, people of the world use worldly things and they're helping they're managing brands a certain way you see from a time where it was simply a name on something right to a time where it evolves and gets power to a point where now it has to be managed because if a wrong impression is given about a brand that is its end and everything let me tell you if a business does not brand right it will never have the value the perceived value it ought to have and it's amazing as it is, you can have the best thing, everything, structure, systems are working, everybody's doing what they want, and they just give a wrong perception. And they say, can I tell you, yes, <laughs> that stuff they are selling, they abduct girls and then cause them to dig. That's the coffee you're drinking. And the person will never take that coffee again. Because every brand has a story. What is your story? What is the story of your business? What is your story as an individual? You get my point, eh? Whether you want it or not, eh? Later on, as you continue, and all these things are there, you don't miss out the most important component on human beings, right? For you, it doesn't work, but for them it works. Their emotions are important. For you, not for you. For you, you don't have to be emotional. You have to be strategic. But for them, eh? Their emotion their opinion about it are what? Important. So we just walk through businesses and then you hear people saying, uh, when you buy this, two dollars are given to the refugees in Iraq for every packet you buy. Mama, you think it's simple? No, perceived. We are selling coffee, but we care for the Iraqis. How many? Two dollars. You get it? But it can change everything. Everything. Everyone knows that if I'm buying this, right? Someone is drinking water and eating food. 
in Iraq. You get my point? That's the power of a story. That's why it's important when some of you begin businesses to take those little small photos. One day, those things inspire greatly. That first job of yours, eh? sit on that table and take a photo. You, those of you who are beginning, smile mobile app, eh? put yourself on that car computer and take a photo. Something that someone can connect with. Sometimes if you don't have a story, you become a threat. Where yeah. did the come from? And there are some things to keep in the story, and there are some things you deliberately kill. Are you hearing what I'm trying to tell you? But everybody has a story. I hope I'm making sense. So it's time to be managed in what you brand experts call brand equity. What is the image? How do we define the image of this business? What is the identity it has along with the image? You know identity and image are two different things, right? What does it identify with? What awareness is out there for this brand? Right? What are the customers thinking? What's the customer's opinion about this brand? How many are beyond satisfaction, are loyal to this brand? How many is this brand associated with? Because your associates define too much. Your friends are your tomorrow. The people you hang around with are your tomorrow. If you want to tell your future, look at the people you sit with. You look. The Bible says, he that walketh with the wise is what? He's wise. That's a spiritual thing. Brands deliberately associate with stronger brands. They do everything they can to make sure that they can be associated with the big people. You understand? That's why some of them send when certain companies do corporate social responsibilities, also these smaller ones come and say, even as we are part of these guys, we are all trying to do the same thing. But what are they trying to do? They're trying to associate. Because they associate show where you're going. The people you work with show where some of you the people you're keeping. I promise your businesses already you frustrated your brand. And I'm going to come to the person because now I'm still dealing with business. You understand? But I'm going to come to the person you. Because you are a brand yourself. Right? So the equity has come through. You get from just satisfying to people being loyal. I know the recent JD power ratings of Mercedes prove that Mercedes Benz is below average. That means in the cars that perform, it is a car that is performing below average. But I'm loyal. <laughs> Praise God. The first cars they are putting Porsche, Wakia, Wati, they are putting Smanya, Toyota. I don't care. I have my story. And by the way, the German word Mercedes means grace. You understand? But I have my. They want me. They want me. Me, they have things they don't. I'm like, mm-hmm. I mean to say that when we're talking about talking, it's not the words you necessarily speak about yourself. No, it's the things people say about you as they perceive the way you carry yourself. Right? Proverbs 27 tells you that do not what? Verses uh, 2. Mm-hmm. He says, let another man praise thee and not thy own mouth. A stranger and not thy own lips. What does that mean? It means, learn to say without saying. That's by creating perception. Right? Simple statements. If I say, like, Kia has the power to surprise. That's a simple statement. When you say power to surprise, eh? It doesn't go into what they go into to make a car. Which technology, who they had to get, that Peter Schreier had to be bought from Volkswagen, what? And then they got some German guy to handle the traction systems. All of that is details for the person who is interested in the Kia. You get it? But most importantly, there is an impression they give. In the simplest words, and let people 
praise that. People speak of, as in, there are certain things, there are certain ingredients, there are certain qualities that they have, right, understand? And some things are very small, very, very small, very, very small. Do you know why Toyota is still making money more than many of these companies? Simple. If my Toyota breaks down, Toyota Uganda is there. Even Guru Toyota is there. They have a regional what? Garage. Uganda, they tell you we have about 800,000 cars. These things you hear, traffic jam. <laughs> yes. We don't have a million cars in this nation. No. You go to a place like Argentina and they have 23 million cars. You go to China, China alone has eight car making companies that we have never seen here. China. You get what I'm coming from? Maybe when we see Toyota, we think it's one time over which country did. I went to Hong Kong one time. I looked for Toyota. Mercedes, Volvo, Z, 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 nothing. You get my point? No, 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 no. It's also working. By the way, it's the biggest plant on the face of the earth. Yeah. And it, it makes high profit. They say you can see the Toyota plant from space. It is that big. Kalamando Shakiri. But it makes affordable. Katifabava Mkalasi affordable to Kolachi. But it has evolved in its management. And now it has become. Even the models now that we've entered into branding, they're different, right? Some of you have probably heard of things like branded house. Huh? A branded house. Who knows what a branded house is? Or who knows an example of a branded house? A branded house is a place where all the sub-products or services eh, are made under the one patent brand. Right? And all are connected to that one patent brand, like iPhone, iMac, MacBook. They're all different products, but they're all under this one it's a branded house. Right? That means it's a branded house. But it's different from house of brands. You understand what I'm saying? It's different from house of brands. These are simple people, products and services, right? They're like sub-brands of sort. But the difference between that and the house of brands, house of brands, when you talk of Apple, Apple is iPhone, iPad, house of brands, its model is different. It tries so much to create opportunity for other brands to build, thrive, compete with each other it's the overhead and supervisor of these things, but it requires a place where it draws back. Eh? You don't even need to know who it is, but it manages all of this. This is what they call a house of brands, like Procter & Gamble. Does anybody know any companies under Procter & Gamble? Hello? Gillet, Palmolive, Pampas. Oh, made by these guys. Just a gillette, gillette. But it's, it's these fellows. They make quite a lot under them, but they are very silent. It's a house of brands, and they allow all these brands to compete and build their own name. They don't need to put a Procter and Gamble there. Right? It's like the way Unilever is doing business. Although for it, it's yeah, but it's trying to do Johnson and Johnson's what, what. It, 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 that's the whole concept. It's also a model of their own. Praise God. And then we have things like blended houses. Blended house is a place where they have a brand X. And then under that, they build brands that build into the bigger entity of the brand to give a certain, it's deliberate, right? The only difference between the blended house and the house of brands is it's sub-brands all under a particular brand and this particular brand overrides them, right? Like the way you see Google. Google began by a search engine, made Gmail, made Calendar, made Maps, right? Invested in little small other businesses, extended to Blogger, 
Picasso, bought YouTube. You, you, you get the idea. And so again, it goes back to how and which model they choose and what works for them, depending on how, again, societies have evolved based on what is available and what is really working for different businesses. And sometimes it even goes down deep into things like taxation, what, what they be wrong for video or more government rules and regulations, and then people find ways of, you get my point, eh? But either way, at the end of the day, if you win, you win. Samsung, how many of you know Samsung? How many of you know what Samsung does? Do you know Samsung makes ships? Ships water. Do you know Samsung makes weaponry? Tankers? Samsung is big. It's not this little division of mobile phones you guys call mobile phones. No, no, it's way bigger than that. It's way bigger than that. Way, way bigger than that. Of all these things I've spoken, they take us back to this underlying thing, the strongest power on the face of the earth, vision. Vision. Your vision defines your brand. Your vision defines your brand, and your brand defines your value. Now I want to get to you, the individual, right? One time they preached about something called Meraki. It's a Greek word used for you as a place of whatever you're doing, a place where you apply love, creativity, right? And will and commitment to something until that thing starts to have you in it. Right? Until that thing gets to a point where when they look at it, it has you. Yeah. It has you. Like That's why Apple is struggling after the death of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs made one of the most powerful statements I ever heard a secular man say. He said, I always valued intuition above intelligence. He said, he said, I always valued intuition above intelligence. Wherever my intuition led me, I went before intelligence could counteract. And because it was his intuition, you saw Steve Jobs in everything Apple made. Even when he's far long dead, it is so hard to speak about Apple and Steve Jobs then come to your head. Because there was a bit of him in the thing. He wasn't just a man disconnected from it. The strongest brands have Meraki. Yeah. Right? Even when you go into the stories, you've heard of Bill Gates. Grandfather, grandmother, his story is telling, give your tithes, I'll open the windows of heaven and bless you. The window thing stayed in his head. There's a part of him that connects to windows that is way bigger than just that software. You get it? It's something that is him. It's him. It's him. So by the time you transition in now drawing the logos, you know, people think that when you have a logo, that is a brand. You understand? Eh? Smile the colors of the logo. That, yes, colors speak something. Green speaks something. Purple speaks something. Yes. And some people have owned colors. If you talk of Nike, Nike has owned what? Yellow. You get it? Different companies are owning certain colors. That some colors you look at, something comes in your head and you're like, I think. Now, Fanero, we've owned certain colors. It's very hard eh, to have certain colors flying somewhere and you don't suspect and it's a narrow and come to your head. Again, it's imprinted deliberately. It's those little stickers on people's cars, it's those t-shirts that are pretty small things, but mm, they're lucky. You get it? It's deliberate. It's deliberate. It's deliberate. When we go now to the individual you, you realize that before it gets into your business, your career and everything you're going to do, the ministry for a preacher and everything, it begins with you. <laughs> Thank God that in scripture we have such a thing as commending yourself to the consciences of men. And how do we do that? How do we commend ourselves to the consciences of men? How about Uganda pastors who read the Bible? The revelation of the truth. The revelation of the truth. He says we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, not handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The underlying glory for the new creation to define perception to men so to have value 
and consequently build a brand for the businesses that you're doing and the ministry that I'm doing begins with the revelation of truth, the manifestation of truth. Let's go a bit deeper there. The prefect of Judea. Pilate. He's with Jesus and they bring Jesus before him. Right? And when they bring Jesus before him, he asks him, are you the king of the Jews? Right? And Jesus says, he says so. Beat the guy, bring him again. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus tells him, my kingdom is not of this world. It cannot be perceived by men who know not the truth. And Pilate asked Jesus, what is the truth? What is truth? Picture for a moment unrighteousness. He's asking righteousness. Truth is standing before unrighteousness, right? And unrighteousness is asking truth. What is truth? You understand? What is truth? What is truth? Because if truth is the only way we commend ourselves to the consciences of men, what is truth? What is truth? What is that thing that enters the man and after later he says, I find no fault in this man. Did Jesus preach the gospel to him? Actually, the scriptures tell us Jesus kept quiet. That means there was perception. Read the scripture. Pilate said unto him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto him, I find in him no fault. But many people don't know that between what Pilate asked and the time he goes out to say that this man has no fault in him, there was a perception revealed in the soul of Pilate. That means truth is easily perceived. Truth is easily perceived, even to men who are not righteous, even to men who are not spiritual. Truth will be seen, even to men who are not spiritual, even to men, you don't need to explain yourself to everyone when you are on the foundation of truth. What is truth? Truth is the person of Jesus Christ. Not just the Savior and Lord who died for you, but of this melted as the Paul says, of whom we have many things to say. That's why when he saw that day, he said, we shall be the heads and not the tail. You shall be above and not beneath. You will go upward and upward only. He said, strangers shall serve you. Kings shall come to your rising. Gentiles shall come to your light. They cannot be all that when your brand is weak. They must see value. A king can only serve where they see value. Somebody shout hallelujah. A gentile can only come to a light where there is value. A stranger can only serve where there is value. And that begins in the revelation of truth. What do you live for? What is your purpose? Who are you? Some of you, you're running into business while well, I feel I have an idea. But before you go into there, first take time for you. Who am I as a brand? Because your idea is you. The reason why it's not taken off, you've not yet taken off in the spirit. Now, for you can't, you can speak all this stuff you want. Listen, I am not boasting, but I have results. And I've seen people who know how to speak. They know how to speak, but they don't have results. What they are speaking is contrary to who they are. Meraki. There is no self in what they are speaking. There is no proof of who they are in the things that they are saying. And there are men who speak less and reproduce more. They manifest more because they've taken time to get into the individual, study themselves, and allow God to first build them. Listen. Wisdom is the mother of all witty invasion, Sophia. But the Bible says he has been made unto us wisdom. To us his wisdom, the mother of all witty inventions, all witty inventions, all ideas that are wise, all things that the knowledge of witty inventions, the mother of all of those ideas is wisdom. The fact that you are born again, you should be 
Makaraman. God will bat something out of you that has not been read or seen. Why? Because you carry Jesus Christ. He's the head. Hallelujah. Because you're building an app, you're going to build something that no scientist could ever think about. No IT. Yes, you all did IT. They can all make apps, yes, but they will be an extra. It's going to be something. It ought to be something. The people look at it and say, look, we've seen pharmacies, but this is different. This is different. We've seen businesses, but this is different. We've seen uh, lecturers, but this one is different. We've seen engineers, but this one is different. We've seen schools, but this one is different. 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 What makes you remarkable? What makes... Listen. You have listened to teachers, but I'm different. I'm not boasting. I'm just different. They will never say it the way I say it. You will bring 20 men, 100 men here, but Apostle Grace is Ruvega. I'm not boasting. It is the truth. And you know how? Even in my prayer, I say, I'm commending myself to the consciences of men in the space that I speak things that really mean that this was distinction on this minister. Oh, it's deliberate. Uganda. It's what? Deliberate. You speak it upon your life. You impute it on your life. You see it in your spirit. Because again, vision. Right? It begins with what you see. You create. Oh, and as you're creating it, you say, write down your vision. He says, it shall not wait. The appointed time comes and it's fulfilled. He that sees it will run with it. What does that mean? God will send people to support it. Praise God, somebody. So, let us walk out with this. That we're not going to make great engineers after this. We're going to make distinctive, remarkable brands. Somebody shout hallelujah. Firstly from ourselves. And then it will go. It will miracle into our businesses. It begins with a man. He always sought a man. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, man of God. Um, about this thing hasn't yet taken off because we haven't taken off in the spirit. Eh? One day, um, I think it was uh, Cost of Discipleship, part one. He said that um, when you take care of God's business, you will attract enough to make any man lose sleep. Okay? Um, and I've seen that in my business. Yeah? Um, so when you say that we've not taken off in the spirit, where is our battle? Because I realized that, um, you see, I'm a salesman, eh? but if I compete with the men of the world at their level, I will not be able to pick them. Why? Because I'm not of this world. So, where exactly is our, is our battleground? Our battleground is the heart. And I'll say that very keenly. When David said, see I sleep in the house of cedars, but the house of God is in curtains. Mm. What did the prophet tell him? He told him, do what is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. When David's heart was in the right place, there was never a question of provision. There was never a question of provision. There was never a question of money. It was never a question of where will I get the gold, where will I get the timber, right? The prophet didn't say, let's pray that God will provide for you all these things. Because in this question of event, there's a provision necessary. It might not necessarily be money, it might be knowledge, right? Resources can come from different ways, right? It can be knowledge, it can be people to support the vision, it can be um, the right need to be presented in the time when the business uh, needs to to profit and it could be many things but it begins with a state of the heart right because out of it are the issues of life you get it that's why it tells us to guard many of the battles we have are in our heart and in our hearts there are usually three or four things we fight with one faith with the heart a man believes you understand the purity right I always go back to that place of the purity of intent. Huh? Blessed are the pure in the heart, in heart, for they shall see the Lord. You must understand that all of these are, are part of, of what defines the heart. Three, 
eternal vision. Hmm? Eternal vision, a vision of eternity in what you're doing. Do you have a vision of eternity, right? He has placed eternity in the hearts of men. But what is eternal in my heart for this thing I'm doing? You understand? Does it have a kingdom end to it? Does it benefit eternity of sort? Or is it to the meeting of my needs so I can get a nice cow? And sometimes it's easy to say, no, 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 I'm actually doing to the glory of God because you have learned the art of speaking. Or because it's the expected answer. Right? But what is really in your heart? Again, that's why I said it's God that examines the heart. He tests our reins. The Bible says to give to every man according to his heart. That's in Jeremiah. He gives every man according to his way. I, the Lord, such the heart, I try the reins even to give a man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Do you realize that the bigness right, of your heart is how much God gives and accords to you? And lastly, the one thing you can never avoid if you're going to be this success again in your heart is the place of giving. Corinthians calls it whose heart is in the giving. Right? Everything that you do, whether it's a business, a company, sales, work, everything, look at it as a place of giving. Don't look at it as a place of receiving. God cares for the results of your receiving when you stop thinking of how much you receive. As an individual, I honestly don't take time to calculate how much I receive except for the issues of giving tithes and above. But if it was not for that, I'm never conscious. But my consciousness, my wife will tell you, is always on giving. She knows that every time we are talking, we are discussing, well, who do we give this, who do we give that, how do we give this, how do we give, because your heart is in giving, right? God loves when the heart is in giving. That means when your heart is giving, every business, every idea, every solution, every story, everything you do, you realize it's always giving to men. It's always answering men. It's always a solution to a problem. It's not answering your problem. No, this is the part where in your heart you forget about you and learn to live for the pattern of common good. These things always come back to you. Do you know how many people are doing things and doing the multiplication of how much they get, what they are going to get, versus the how many people, how many hearts they are going to change? Oh, no, 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 but you see, do I want to earn losses? Again here, if it's an eternal purpose and it's giving to men, how can God not sustain it? It's not possible. Uh huh. There's a thing called um, neuromarketing where you actually did a little bit of, of it in school, um, where you actually study the human brain and and try to understand the coloration. They try to understand how to market a good to humans. And sometimes I'm concerning you're talking about branding and. I wanted you to help me understand how you differentiate between the part of branding and marketing. Because sometimes, yes, the, the marketing creates a brand, but sometimes you get lost in between there because you could think you're branding, yet you're marketing, and yet you're marketing, yet you're branding. Okay. So. Well, thank you very much. Again, I'm going to speak what I know according to my experience in my banking field. When we say we are marketing something, again, like you've said, Marketing was as a result of managing brands. The whole idea of marketing came through as men were learning to manage brands, right? Because now they start to look at the other outward things like profitability. What imagines on this? How can we do this to earn more of this such that we continue extending? Marketing was as a result of brand. Again, how do you not confuse them? One of the things that you must have in the back of your head the brand defines the marketing, right? You cannot deceive yourself that you can sell certain things. Some things are not sellable if they don't have a story, an identity to them, an image to them, and everything in them. It's like some of you who have sold services. Do you realize the service is not like a product? Eh? Like if you're selling Coke, I can test it. Eh? Selling a service, eh? that's why I feel sorry for people who sell accounts. Do I eat it? I can eat it and get full. Like, how do you sell a service? 
Like, I've seen people come into my office and they are selling insurance. It's hard to sell insurance. Like, to assure me that in case you die, you, like, <laughs> you understand? You're even telling me that, you know, you can die. You're putting all, oh, come on, far from me. But my point is that brands are the reasons why marketing exists, right? And why there's strategy in marketing. And strategies in marketing, again, you realize that when men start strategizing, uh, market strategies, drawing market strategies, again, it has so much to do with the perceived, the brand. You understand? That's why I told you it goes into who do we go for, why do we go for that person. Now, when you go into that neural thing, it is more psychological than it is practical. When you see the thought of the American in how they do business and the thought, for example, of the Asians and how they do business, it's different. It's different. For example, I think India has picked so much on the fourth industrial revolution than even probably these more developed European nations because of their model of selling, the way they do things. You get my point? Eh? I'll give you a simple example, very basic example. I worked with Indians. I knew how they could quickly connect one thing to another and make business going and deal with the details later. Because, again, partly the intuition, but most people, they are taught to know what to look to. I saw men who would lend on instinct. And guys, they give them money and guys later come to perfect securities and sign documentation. When that money is already gone, then I also saw the American way of how you have to take every step, make sure all the documents are right, make sure that you understand what I'm trying to tell you. And then you realize that these ones are so much managing risk. You get it? But it's all based on the elements that are used in the idea and concept of what you and I call marketing. I would rather for a Christian you don't so much invest in the neuropsychological way of selling because you lose truth somewhere. You, you lose truth somewhere. Because again, as you go deeper into it, you realize it starts to get into deception and manipulation. Because it's how I can go into the plasticity of your mind and expand it to a direction to get an idea and sell it to you. But at that end, you don't even have interest in improving the ingredient of your product in managing the competition to say, you know what, I'm doing this to this quality so I can get this much. It doesn't have any accountability. It ends in simple manipulation. You get my point, eh? Don't invest so much in that. Let's not leave truth here. Let's not leave truth here. It's like companies that manage PR in deception. Why do people think that PR has to be deception? You know, PR is not supposed necessarily to be deception. But PR is the wisdom of managing people amid this crisis. If you don't know, say, give us time to research. Let people feel that you care, that you don't need to lie to them to have wonderful PR. But today people think that all PR is deception and manipulation and twitching of, you know, details to, eh? it's not so. Truth, 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 fundamental. Okay, so we're going to pray. Now, this is how we choose to pray. We're saying, God, many things have been spoken. You did not make us hear these things to go back no more men. You didn't. I feel that many of the words that have been spoken were a prophetic voice to throw. You see what I'm saying? So what our prayer is going to be tonight is, God, we have visions. Even me, I'm still dreaming. I'm miracling, I'm confessing, I'm commending myself to the consciences of men through the manifestation of truth. You understand it? All this, I'm giving what I can, and another man will come and do what they can. But our simple prayer is going to be that God, everything spoken and shared that appeals to us as mind, let it be for manifestation. What would it add if I ignore cryptography and never build something for my children to look after and say, indeed, there was an eternal purpose to this man's knowledge? What is it for me to be a nice PR person and my children's children don't see? Purpose. What is it for me to speak of brand and Panero fails? You understand? We want to pray that God, you have begun this seed through leader, director, and I feel that the impartation of this evening too. Somebody raise your hands and speak to God in the simplest language that you can. If you have tongues, speak them. Robo shake it. 
Richeremando robosce per vere ba 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 Father, you have ordained us for a purpose. You have called us for history. You have put things in us way bigger than many men can articulate. Somebody speak your hand and tell God in this meeting, I feel the responsibility to change Uganda. I feel the responsibility to change Africa. I feel the responsibility to change this world. I feel the responsibility to live this world different from the way I found it. I feel the responsibility to go on top go ahead to be the head and not the tail, to go above and ahead of my peers in bringing an idea, an invention, a testimony, an experience, an answer, a solution, something to the tip of this world, to the tip of this universe, to join those that have gone ahead of me, to write history with them. The Adam Smith wrote economics and up to now we are caught to them. Men that have brought the ideas, the geniuses of social media and all these names that we hear being mentioned. It's more than the name God, it's the responsibility that comes with that. That through that will the gospel, that through that salvation will come, healing will come. Men will know you. Thank God for men like the Shred Masiwas, who not only are thriving in the business world, but their purpose and cause is bringing many to the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God, we go talk there. We enter this. We go in that to see your word and power come to pass, that we might impact and impact many, that we might change things like the Mikoraitari, who were the first telecommunication people in this land, who earned hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, but affected and had effects and inspired and mentored many young men to change the world, to change the universe, to change people and how they see things. God may be big change agents. May people look at us and say, that we are different, that in the field you have called them, that they be best, that they be number one, that they carry that flag so high, with your name flying high, that they will come and ask them, what is the secret, and they will simply say it was the truth, it was the manifestation of the truth, we commended ourselves to the consciousness of men, our values were raised, and men praised the values on our life. Our values were spoken of. Our names went ahead of us. And when they were mentioned, we put Jesus. We put Jesus. We put Jesus. That can only be so. And not other way. Somebody give the Lord a man a of praise. And say Amen. And Amen. And Amen. God bless you. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.